Welcome into SGTV's, SGTV's coverage of the Student Government Executive Candidate deba Debate. I'm Will Brownsburg. And I'm Zane Heinlein. Thanks for joining us tonight. Zane, tonight we're looking at one speaker candidate. We have two vice presidential candidates and three presidential candidates. What issues are you looking to be the center of? You know, I'm very interested in um, mental health issues that are, that are going to be brought up tonight. Yeah, also, we're probably going to talk about parking. I'd expect another another um, topic of debate, excuse me, is definitely going to be the Intervenian Protest, the Heritage Act. So what do you expect from this? Hopefully they are down to rename Intervenian Protest. That is been a big issue that's on campus of protests that we just covered not a long ago. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to start off with the speaker candidate tonight. Just one running unopposed. That's Noah Glasgow, two-year senator, just a sophomore, so he's been in the Senate both years that he's been here. Currently the chair of the Student Life Committee, biggest committee in the Senate, so he's already sort of the number two or number three there. So do you think USC students have something to trust in the, in the new speaker of the Senate? Yes, well, he is the only candidate running for this position, so it's not like they have much of a choice, but also he does have a proven record of being involved on campus. And then at the same time, we're going to have two, uh, two vice presidential candidates. One of them leads the University of South Carolina Freshman Council, which is the way the freshmen get involved in student government. That's Faith Gravely. She's running on the Catalyst ticket. And then the other one, Maya Porzio, she's worked in the President's Cabinet the past two years. Um, now shifting over to try to run for vice president. She's running on the Newton Porzio campaign. Obviously, you know, two names there. So when we're looking at them debating, how will one establish themselves differently? That's very true. We have two very strong candidates for that position. We have one working with directly with underclassmen and one working with president as you said. Absolutely. And then moving to president, we have those two tickets plus one additional candidate. The two presidential candidates on the Catalyst campaign, it's uh, Garujo Rupra and then uh, Reedy Newton on the on the Newton Corsio. And then, so out of those two on the tickets, how will they differentiate themselves from their candidates? Mm -hmm. we, we, we will have to see what comes back. There you go, there you go. You We're much. ramping up the coverage. We're running a few minutes late. Like I mentioned, we have a third presidential candidate as well. Uh, that is Nicholas Marzullo, so he is without a running mate, so coming in to, trying to talk about how his campaign stands alone, his running mate um, stepped away from the competition shortly, and we also had a presidential candidate who just left the competition. So what's going to be the legacy of people who were on the ticket and now suddenly are shooting to I agree, it's going to be very interesting to see what people are going to have to say tonight with the different opinions and everyone clashing and trying to prove that they are the best person to lead the university. Absolutely, we'll have that all coming up as soon as things get set here in the Russell House Ballroom. Speaker of the Student Senate, up next. Tonight's debate will showcase each executive office separately to allow candidates for each office to present an overview of their platforms and respond to questions. The student body treasurer position is being converted to a position called the Secretary of Finance, which will be in the student body president's cabinet. So there are only three executive positions to vote on this year. The candidate for Speaker of the Senate will go first, followed by the candidates for Vice President and candidates for President. Before we get started, I'd like to encourage all of our candidates to challenge each other, but to remain civil. Debates like these allow us to engage in discourse about the future of our wonderful university. To all the students watching tonight, I want to thank you for being engaged in our university community. I also want to thank each of you to take what you hear tonight and share it with your fellow Gamecocks that are not here. Once elected, the, these decisions these candidates will make will make profound impacts on our student body. And it's important that as students, we hold each other accountable and keep one another informed. I would also like to thank SGTV and the Daily Game Clock for covering the debate tonight so that even more students can access tonight's debate. 
With all of that said, I would like to introduce our debate moder moderators. Our debate will be moderated by Kaylee Coda, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Gamecock, and Callista Pushman, the station manager of SGTV, and myself. I am so thankful for Kaylee and Callista for being moderators and for their willingness to dedicate their time to us tonight. With that, Callista will run us through the rules of the night. Thank you, Morgan. Here's how tonight's debate will work. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to provide an opening statement. They will then answer roughly five to seven questions. All candidates will have 60 seconds to respond to each question. After 60 seconds, we will cut off responses. All other candidates are allowed one 30-second rebuttal per question. Candidates are allowed 20 seconds to respond to a rebuttal. Please raise your hand if you want to rebuttal or respond. Candidates will be allowed to remove their mask while they are on stage, but candidates should put their mask back on upon leaving the stage. Let's proceed with our first candidate of the night. Candidate for Speaker of the Student Senate, please come up. Thank you, Calista. Our first position of the night is Speaker of the Student Senate. There is one candidate for this position, and that is Noah Glasgow. Noah, you will have 60 seconds for your opening statement. Cool. Can you? Okay, cool. Great. Great. Go. Awesome. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Noah Glasgow. Uh, I am running for Speaker of the Student Senate because opportunity at our university shouldn't be determined by access to power. Whether it be combating sexual assault and holding our university to account when they protect abusers, tackling campus transit issues, treating sustainability, racial justice, menstrual equity issues, for the equity issue that it is, we can take on all of these challenges through building community. As chairman of the Student Life Committee, the largest committee in the Student Senate, I have taken on some pretty big fights, like fighting to establish a Secretary of Disability Services within the President's Cabinet, to advocate for all students with disabilities, from abolishing filing fees, which is this is the first year where we can uh, uh, all collect signatures to appear on the ballot instead of having to pay a fee to create equitable outcomes for our candidates, uh, and many other fights. So that's why I'm very excited to start running this campaign with y'all. Thank you, Noah. Now we'll begin with some questions. Remember, you have a minute to answer each of these. Can you explain to students what the position of Speaker of the Student Senate entails? Yes, so Speaker of the Student Senate is the presiding officer over the Student Senate, uh, all 50 senators. Uh, so it is uh, an executive position. Uh, so it is actually the only position within student government that is both part of the legislative and executive branch. So in the case of ties, we can break ties in the Senate. I have uh, firsthand experience of a bill coming to the floor uh, where it tied, and precedent tells the speaker to vote no. But uh, as a candidate, I'm going to pledge that I don't believe that's correct. Uh, anytime that there is a vote uh, that ties in the student senate, I'm going to vote my conscience, because the one time that you get to vote, you should not be held back by what precedent tells you. That doesn't serve the student body, and we can do better, and we must be better. Another thing that we can do is we can program and we can help senators pursue legislation that's rooted in community. We can connect them with university contacts to help them implement that legislation on a mass scale. Thank you. Now with voting your conscience, how do you plan to balance your own opinions while still representing the opinions of all the senators? Yes, so that's actually a really great question. Uh, ultimately, when it comes down to a tie, it's up to me to break it. Um, so I would just have to take my experience, my two terms in Student Senate, knowing what I know about the student body as a student here and the fights that I've taken on before as a student senator, as a chairman of the Student Life Committee, uh, and then I would uh, vote accordingly to what's best for the student body. It might not be what the Senate wants, but it is what's best for the student body. Thank you. Over the past few years, we've seen an increase in turnover in the Student Senate, and that has led to some vacancies. What is your plan to increase retention rates? I'm so glad you asked that because I was actually just talking about that today with our current speaker, uh, Morgiana McDevitt, and a few candidates on my campaign. I think a big problem that we have in Student Senate is that we don't tackle issues that directly impact students. And another thing is that it's not reflective of our student body. Great, we can have demographics, but you know, diversity is really just a catch-all term that means 
having demographics. What we need is intersectionality in our student senate, right? And that is the lived experience, that's the understanding of a community's power, and using that knowledge to build alliances for social change. That's what we need to pursue in our legislation. We need to legislate in defense of black lives. We need to legislate in defense of sustainable justice, for menstrual equity. These are the kinds of fights that I intend to take on with my senators. That's why I chose these senators to be on my campaign. And when we do this, we can go out to community, we can have these interest meetings, so we show the student body that we're actually taking on issues that matter, big issues that matter. Okay, that's time. Thank you. Thank you. Can you please explain what you mean by menstrual equity? Yes, so, uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Right now, they are, uh, you know, in the state of South Carolina, hygiene products, tampons, pads, they are taxed as a luxury item, and that's just not true when we all need them. Uh, menstrual equity means providing resources, hygiene products for people, and let's be clear, it's not just women that menstruate. It's trans men, it's non-binary individuals, it's gender queer people. This is an equity issue across the board. That's why I say menstrual justice, that's not why I say women's justice issue, because, I mean, it is a women's justice issue, but across the board we need to be representative of everybody. Uh, so that's what I say when menstrual equity, providing those resources for everybody who does menstruate. Thank you. And now during your interview on Friday, when you were talking about your campaign platform points, you said diversity is the fruit and equity is the root. Can you elaborate on what that means and how it relates to your platform? Yeah, so again, diversity is great um, because it means you know having just physical demographics present, but that alone does not fix the issues. What we need is intersectionality in our policy making. We need intersectionality within our student senate. That's understanding a community's power or lack thereof, and then using that information to build alliances for social change, where we can partner with community. Uh, you know, diverse. So you know, diversity. That's a fruit. That's something that comes from equity. What we need is equity. That means that we need to be able to. Uh, you know, provide resources that aren't necessarily equal across the board, but dependent on need. So whether that be funding, you know, with our student organizations, which, by the way, we, because we've abolished the, uh, the treasurer's office and all of that stuff, finance committee is in a very unique position right now to where we control the uh, funding process from start to finish. It's up, on, it's up to us to really go out to community and uh, make sure that we're providing equitable funding for our student organizations. Thank you. Now you've said that you, you've said your plan to modernize our campus. Can you elaborate on what this means and how you plan to do so? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. You've said your plan to modernize our campus. Can you elaborate on what that means and how you plan to do so? Uh, I, are you referring to accessibility? It was in an Instagram post from your campaign. Oh, okay, yes. Of course. Uh, so yeah, so I want to modernize an It's On Us campaign. Um, so we did that a couple years back with student body president uh, Michael Parks. Uh, what we really need to do is tackle sexual assault. Um, you know, it, it's a huge issue and it's so personal to multiple people uh, on campus, including myself. Um, you know, It's On Us was great because there was this whole push for it. We advertised, you know, we really need to tac uh, tackle uh, sexual assault on campus for the issue that it is. But what I want to do is I want to use my uh, office to program and modernize that uh, to where we're tackling bigger issues and uh, issues that are unique now that are being spoken about more, such as black transgender assault and the disparities that exist within reporting. Uh, so that's another thing that I really want to do. All right, can you just expand a little bit about what the It's On Us initiative is for people who don't know? Yeah, so the It's On Us uh, initiative was founded by the Obama-Biden administration, I believe back in 2010. Um, and so it was just a big push by the White House to tackle campus sexual assaults across universities uh, in America. Uh, so not just bringing awareness to it, but providing resources to prevent that, or you know, if you do see this in, uh, circumstance, you know how to report it. We've got great save up uh, uh, counselors here at the university. Unfortunately, I just had an experience with them, uh, having to go to them the other day. Um, but you know, they're always there, um, providing, being able to provide those resources to us. Um, so just getting to partner with them, which is something that I've done before uh, with Haley Garland, who's on my campaign, who's running for student senate along with us. Uh, so, so those are some of the things that It's On Us will tackle. All right, now you made it clear that bettering the university's response to sexual assault on campus is at the core of your platform. I know you've already talked about a few points. 
but could you continue to explain some more specifics on how you plan to improve the university's response to sexual assault on campus? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the Title IX office is taking a lot of steps. Uh, you know, uh, Dean Samuels, who I've met with, says that you know we are completely redoing how we go about the reporting process with Title IX. That's great because we recognize that there is a huge issue on campus with how we report and how Title IX tackles issues. Um, so just, but the big problem is a lot of people don't know the reforms that we're making and that are currently happening. A lot of people don't know that we've hired a new Title IX coordinator, right? So we need to be able to use our resources in the student government to get that message out there to show, you know, these are the steps that the university is taking. Not just saying, okay, we're making a change here and there creating big structural changes. This is exactly what we're doing. All right, thank you. And making campus more accessible for people with disabilities is another large part of your platform. So could you give us some specifics for how you plan to accomplish these goals? Yes, lovely question. I'm so glad you asked me that. I am going to be the first speaker of the Student Senate to add an ASL signer to my staff uh, to be able to live translate all Senate sessions while they're happening. You know, I've taken on some pretty big fights. Um, from creating that Secretary of Disability Services. When I passed that legislation, the student body president vetoed it. But good thing, I dug in and I found a workaround and I got it passed anyways, and it's going to happen next term. So I'm very excited for that. Um, another thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get into Russell House, uh, work with them to put a ramp onto the steps of the Russell House Theater uh, where we hold Senate. I remember our student body vice president, Emily Dangler, she had some crutches for a day or a, or a boot. One of our senators had crutches. It was very hard for them to get up the steps. And if any of you have ever had like temporary disabilities with like crutches or anything like that, you know how hard it is to get around campus. Uh, you should always be able, whether you're in a wheelchair, a scooter, you need crutches, you're in a boot, to be able to participate within our student That's government. That's time. All right, well, thank you, Noah. Those are all the questions we have for you. Thanks awesome, for thank here. you so much. All right, we're going to take the next couple minutes to transition over to our vice presidential. Hi everyone, my name is Faith Gravely and I'm a junior political science major from Somerville, South Carolina. And I'm ecstatic to be your candidate for student body vice president. Over the past three years at Carolina, I've held leadership positions both within student government as where I currently serve as co-freshman council director and outside of student government in the residence hall association where I currently preside as president. The purpose of the student body vice president's office is to put on programming that is indicative of the student wants and needs. Too often, student government fails to recognize the disconnect between the student body, student representation, and administration. It is time for our student leaders to stand up and take action and bridge the gap between these students and their representation and better the student experience. I am ready to be a catalyst and give students the opportunity to be a catalyst for the change that they want to see. Thank you, Faith. Maya, you may now proceed with your opening statement. Again, you will have one minute. My name is Maya Porzio, and I'm running for student body vice president alongside my running mate for student body president, Reedy Newton. I'm a junior here on campus majoring in political science and double minoring in business administration and public relations. On campus, I'm involved with university ambassadors, which is definitely a highlight of my week, being able to tour potential future Gamecocks around campus. 
I'm also involved in Greek life within Alpha Gamma Delta, Omicron Delta Kappa, and then I am also been involved in student government for the past three years, starting off in freshman council, transitioning into the role of Secretary of Safety and Transportation, and currently hold the position of Secretary of Health and Wellness. Coming to this university as an out-of-state student, I was definitely nervous, but I can confidently say this university has become my home away from home, and I hope to bring that feeling to every single student at this university. The future is Newton Porcio. Thank you. Now we'll proceed with the questions. You are both running with a joint candidate. Can you explain your platforms and how you will work with the president to accomplish your goals? We'll start with Faith. Absolutely. So my running mate's name is Garujal Rupra, and she's running to be your next student body president. Garujal and I met in freshman council, where I was on the sustainability committee, and she was on the diversity and inclusion committee. Um, we became very, very good friends through that, and have stayed very, very close over the last couple of years. And we met pretty organically at an NAACP event, and um, kind of decided to start this movement together, all about progressing Carolina. And um, the way that we kind of deduce that down is through, you know, innovating um, future and current plans, um, advocating for all students, and then motivating students to be catalysts for change. And the way that we kind of consolidate that is through the words, I am. Because it's extraordinarily important to recognize each individual person and their unique traits, while also representing our Carolina community. And so for us, I am means I am a catalyst for positive change. All right, thank you. Maya, the same question. So I'm running with Reedy Newton, who's running for student body president. Um, and Reedy and I met this year in cabinet, and I've seen the phenomenal work that she's done with government relations. She cares about the student body, has done research to see what they need. Um, and I can just tell her passion and energy for everything that she does, and is genuinely one of the nicest people I've ever met, which is why I chose to run with her on this journey. Um, and the way that we structured our platform was we titled it The Future Is. That is an open and interpretive statement because we wanted the student body to be able to fill in what the future means to them. We came up with eight platform points of what the future means to us, and from there we've been asking students like to elaborate and collaborate with us on our initiatives to make sure that we are going forward and putting forward into our platform like what the student body wants and what they want to see. All right, thank you. Now, even though you're both on joint tickets, there's always the possibility that you will get elected and your running mate will not. What would you do if you got elected and your running mate didn't? This time, we'll start with Maya. Yeah, absolutely. So I have worked with um, JJ in freshman council, and we were definitely um, have worked together in large capacities. And I will say, like, while I did choose to run with Reedy Newton for all of the reasons that I have stated, I'm obviously open and willing to collaborate with anybody who's willing to make a change at this university. Um, at the end of the day, that's what's important to all of us is that we're putting our best foot forward and enacting all of the things that we hope to see at this university. And I believe that starts with collaboration between the vice president and the president's office. All right, thank you. Faith? Yes, of course, I picked my running mate for a reason as well. Um, as I stated earlier, we've been friends. I truly believe in her and feel that she is the best person for this position. But obviously, in the instance that you know she doesn't get voted in, I think at the end of the day, it is our duty and responsibility as elected officials at this university to fulfill the roles that are outlined in our constitution and codes. And so for me, it is extraordinarily important to collaborate across all offices, whether that person that I ran with gets voted in or not. Thank you. The Vice President's Office oversees programming initiatives. What is one initiative or program you would like to accomplish during your first 100 days in office? And we'll go to Faith. Of course. So back when I was a sophomore, I had the opportunity to be the Chief of Staff to the Speaker of the Student Senate. And one of the things that I got to do was sit in on the SGXU committee, um, which is where basically the student government was to collaborate with outside organizations to put on some sort of programming initiative. And what we kind of actually saw was that the uh, program that was picked was actually a student government program. They selected freshman council to win. Um, and that was actually not my first choice. My first choice was actually um, one that the Alphas presented. And it was a choice to have a walkthrough exhibit that highlighted all of the different minority voices that have come through the University of South Carolina. I think it's extraordinarily important to uplift those voices and show that we do hear them and that we do recognize their needs and that there have been people that have come through this university who have done the things that they are trying to accomplish. And so I think that it's really important that we highlight them, especially with the Heritage Act that we do have, where a lot of our buildings are highlighting people that we probably shouldn't be. And so that That's is time. the reason. Thank you. 
Maya, the same question. Can you repeat it just? Yeah. The vice president's office oversees programming initiatives. What is one initiative or program you would like to accomplish during your first 100 days in office? Absolutely. So as my current role of secretary in health and wellness, um, I was actually told at the beginning of this year that all programming would move completely to the vice president's office, um, which I think made me really sad at first because I was so excited to put on events like Stigma Free USC, like Safety Week, which I did the year prior. And I think that I got such a great experience out of cabinet being able to have that under me. Um, so what I did was I immediately reached out to Emily Dangler and said, I want to work with you on this. And she was more than happy and willing um, to work with me on that initiative. So I definitely within those first 100 days want to make that stigma-free initiative instead of just that week have that stigma-free USC. Be that something that we continue out throughout the year where we have programming, we have the research that I've collected through the past semester and put initiatives forward that the students want to see. All right, thank you. Now each of you has spoken about promoting mental health resources on campus. Please give specifics of how you plan to do so. This time we'll be starting with Maya. Absolutely. So this past semester, I was able to create my own survey um, where I was able to research all of like what students felt of the current counseling services here on campus. And then I was able to meet with April Scott, who is like the director of the counseling center as well. And I was able to share this research with her. And we came up with some pretty concrete plans as to ways to put this in action. So first, that would be to advocate for more money to go into more counselors and more space. This comes through student voices, which is exactly what she told me. She said that faculty have kind of reached their limit as to what they can do. So now it's up to you as the student to advocate for it. So we definitely want to push for that to make sure that every student can see a counselor because right now for every one student, for every one counselor, there's 1600 students that they're responsible for seeing, which is just not sustainable. So definitely pushing for that and also trying to implement those wellness days back into our schedule to make sure that students know that we value their mental health. All right, thank you. Faith, the same question. Yes, of course. So I think that mental health is one of the biggest issues that we do have on campus. Um, as Maya did state, there are a very, very large disproportionate form when it comes to counselors to students. And I think what's really important is to utilize and and show students the resources that we do already have. So we have to have streamlined communication from our health and safety department to the students to actually let them know what resources we have on campus. And so some of the ways that we've decided to do that is through um, implementing a optional training over the summer that would kind of happen at the same exact time as your alcohol EDU that would teach you about those resources. That way throughout the entirety of your college experience, you know what resources are on campus and you know exactly how to use them. Thank you. Now, one question that was submitted to us on social media is, quote, how do you intend to promote diversity and inclusion both through your staff and your future initiatives? You each have one minute to respond. And we're going to start with Faith. Of course. So obviously, for me, uplifting minority voices is an extremely, extremely important thing, which is why I decided to run with the only uh, woman of color on uh, any executive ticket right now. Um, and so for me, it's really important to show students that there is people out here representing them. I think right now we do celebrate diversity in pockets, and I think it's important to celebrate diversity all across campus. Um, and so obviously with having someone um, in the student body president's office that is a person or a woman of color, um, that will show that the students that represent with her that she is there to listen to them and is there to hear their voices. Um, and so I think as well through my staff, it's extraordinarily important to reach out to those pockets of campus that haven't been connected with and give them the opportunity to join student government and apply for these positions. Thank you. Maya, the same question. Absolutely. I think as an ambassador, I've had an amazing experience and opportunity being surrounded by people from different backgrounds and upbringings. And we've all realized that we came here and from very different paths. And that's so important to me because in high school, I didn't necessarily have this diverse experience, but in college, I've definitely made that an effort of mine to be able to have those open conversations, get to know people from different backgrounds and understand where they come from. Because at the end of the day, I'm advertising this school to so many different groups um, of people. And I wanna make sure that everybody can find their home here. Um, and just because I don't necessarily descriptively represent everybody on this campus doesn't mean that I won't substantively represent them, um, meaning I won't not put policies forward that are going to benefit everybody. I'm going to make it my mission that I am definitely hearing every single student and their needs um, from every single background and bringing those policies forward to benefit the entirety of the student body. All right, thank you. 
So now we're going to move on to some candidate-specific questions. Faith, we'll start with you. The first question regards our interview on Friday. Um, you said you were not happy with the current programming initiative, so I was wondering what ideas you have to change those and how you'll accomplish that. Absolutely. So obviously, Emily Dangler has done an amazing job this year. I've been able to work with her as somebody on her uh, staff, and she's done a really great job when it comes to pushing out all of the initiatives that the vice president office has done in the past. But I think what we've seen over the past couple of years is that these initiatives are not being as effective as they could be. And so what I've noticed in my programming experiences is that a trial and error period is really, really important. Um, obviously, every single student class and every single student wants something different. And so it's important to be able to put on programming initiatives and see how the students react. And then that way, you will know how to program better in the future. Um, and so for me, I think it's really important to maybe take some of these weeks that are really long and giving out minimal information every single day and consolidate them into one large event. That way students can have more access to information and more access to resources in one singular location rather than having to show back up on Green Street every single week to receive it. Thank you, Amaya. You have 30 seconds to respond. Yeah, absolutely. I will say that a big positive of hosting some of those weeks that I have, such as Safety Week and Stigma Free Week, has been it's a huge week long of information instead of just one day because mental health on campus deserves more than a day, as does safety. Um, so being able to have that week to push that information out to students, get that social media awareness generated because students have such various schedules that one day doesn't necessarily always work. So I have enjoyed that week, but also trying to make them yearly initiatives, I think is important as well. Sure, thank you. So back to Faith, you said you want to go beyond student government and listen to all students on campus. Can you specify how you plan to accomplish that? Yes, so one of the platform points um, that Garujal and I have is actually holding in lunches. So I don't know if any of you remember um, back when we had President Kaslin, but he would basically hold these mon monthly lunches where he would invite student leaders to come and speak with him about the different initiatives that they're doing and the different problems they see on campus. And one of the really important things to me is that we actually have targeted audiences for these lunches so that we can actually hear from all different students across campus rather than just student leaders. So it's really important for me to hold some sort of monthly lunch with student with student leaders, with students from certain areas of campus, with administration, and with our executive officers, so we can actually hear the needs and wants of the students and put on programming initiatives and present policy that can actually affect them in the way that they would like to be affected. Thank you. And another thing you mentioned throughout our interview time on Friday was that you are a first-generation student. So I was wondering how that affects your time on campus and how you plan to represent other first-generation students. Absolutely. So um, obviously, I, I am a first generation college student. Um, my mother was a single mother, um, and she uh, definitely had to raise me. And I think that it had a lot to do with kind of my college experience is how she raised me and the person that she you know, made me who I am today. Um, and so for me, it was really, really hard when I was coming to college because I didn't really know if I wanted a large college or a small one. I didn't know if I wanted to stay in state or out of state. And it was a really difficult time and I had nobody to lean on throughout that. Um, and so for me, it's really, really important to target those freshmen and give them access to the resources that they need so that they can be um, better and have more a better student experience. And so one of the things that I would love to do is to create some sort of website or facilitate some sort of information guide to students that has information such as how to use a meal swipe. I was very embarrassed my freshman year when I had to ask the girl at Chick-fil-A what I could get for a meal swipe. And I feel like I should know that information as a freshman before I have to go up to her and ask. And so it's very important for me to have that information be given to students where they can access their. Thank you. Now, Maya, we have a few questions for you. Uh, you mentioned in our interview on Friday and as well as a few minutes ago that the counselor student ratio is not feasible. You said you also plan to advocate to get more funding, and you talked about how the student voice is important in that. Do you have any other specifics you can elaborate on on how you plan to go about that? Yeah, of course. So we definitely devised a plan, and um, really what it comes down to is me um, and whoever, like, the next candidates are for student body vice president or student body president, being able to go up and actually go in front of the board of visitors and the board of trustees and let them know that this is where we want our money. This is where we want um, our tuition to go towards because right now we have that student health fee, um, but it's just not enough to be able to assist us in the programs that we're seeking out here on campus. So by being able um, to go into those board meetings and be able to let them know what students want to see and we where we want the money allocated um, is a perfect way for us to be able to get more funding for those resources that I mentioned. 
Thank you. And now another thing you've talked about is wellness days. So first, I was wondering if those would be in addition to other university holidays. And then second, I was wondering if you could tell us more about how you can make those a reality. Yeah, so they definitely like will be in addition to other university holidays. Like we wouldn't remove like Thanksgiving for them or anything like that. Um, but being able to have those just even a couple throughout the semester spread around um, to be able to make sure that students have that break that is needed throughout their daily weeks. Um, again, I think to be able to implement those, it really goes beyond um, just talking as like a student board and taking it to the next level and being able to go to those board of visitors, board of trustees meeting, let them know that this is what we want as students. Also being able to show the mass amount of students that might need those and want those as well um, by getting petitions, signatures to show them the amounts. Um, because it's one thing for me to say that I want it or that I know that people want it, but it's another thing for me to show that people want it. Um, and that's definitely important to me as somebody who's running for student body vice president to put the policies forward that the students want. Um, and I do believe that this would benefit our student body. Thank you. And now another thing you talked about was that you have a plan to advocate for a safe transition to normalcy related to COVID-19. So can you explain a bit about what this means and how you plan to accomplish that? Yeah, so right now we are still in a state of wearing masks, um, routine testing and things like that. And we are going to be the best examples that we possibly can be throughout that time. Um, so that's definitely important to me is setting that standard. But then as we hopefully one day are able um, in the near future to come out of those masks every day, um, being able to like be there for students, kind of let them know that there's still a way to do this safely. Um, by having like kind of signage, making sure that students, if they are sick, still feel that they can come to class wearing a mask and not be embarrassed that they're the only one maybe there wearing a mask and kind of break that stigma of, oh, you're wearing a mask, like, do you have COVID? Like, kind of transition us into what this new normal will be. And while we don't know what that looks like there, I'm committed to being there for it um, and advocating and being a role model for our student body when that time comes. Thank you, candidates. Those are all the questions we have for you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll be hearing from our candidates for student body president. We'll take a brief pause to resettle ourselves and then the candidates for student body president can come up on stage. Well, I feel like this, um, this, the question is really solidified both of the parties, both of the campaign strong platforms. You have the Newman Porzio campaign that has strong emphasis on mental health and the Catalyst campaign with strong emphasis on injustice and racial justice on campus. Right, and like you said, we're about to see their running mates, um, possibly in addition to uh, one other candidate, and we'll be able to see what we're going to get here. Um, interested to see how those platforms transition with Lucia Rupra, with Rady, with Rady Newton, and whoever else. Um, you know, I'm looking to see if Nick Marzola will also be up here or not. It looks like he's walking up onto the stage right now. Um, so we'll have those three candidates in just a minute, as soon as Calissa and Kaylee are ready to uh, introduce this next set. Yes, please. Thank you, candidates. So our candidates for the student body president position are Garujo Rupra, Reedy Newton, and Nicholas Marzullo. Candidates, thank you for coming forward to the stage. Just to remember, you'll have 60 seconds to respond to each question. After 60 seconds, we will cut off responses. All other candidates are allowed one 30-second rebuttal per question. Candidates are allowed 20 seconds to respond to a rebuttal. Please raise your hand if you want to rebuttal or to respond. Karujo, you can proceed with your opening statement. Remember, you'll have one minute. Hi, Carolina. My name is Garujal Rupra. I'm a junior public health major from Spartanburg, South Carolina, and I am running to be your next student body president. Throughout my time at the university, I've been fortunate to have great experiences in student government, Phi Delta Epsilon, and within the Columbia community as both a trio mentor and at the Free Medical Clinic. Through these experiences, I've seen how imperative it is to uplift student voices in our community. I also know that administrative advocacy, highlighting what each and every Gamecock hopes to see is paramount to the role of the president. Time and time again, the university fails to be representative of every single student that walks on this campus. It's time for our university's culture to shift. 
And that's why I am going to deliver on the changes that the student body wants and deserves to see. Thank you, Rudy. You can proceed with your statement. And remember, you'll also have 60 seconds. Perfect, thank you. My name is Reedy Newton, and I'm running to be your next student body president alongside my running mate, Maya Porzio. I'm a junior from Bluffton, South Carolina, and my love for this university dates back four generations. My grandmother was the first woman ever to graduate with an MBA from the University of South Carolina, and I wanna inspire the next generation of firsts for every Gamecock on this campus. Um, I've been involved in multiple different organizations on and off campus. I served um, over at the State House for three years, um, specifically on campus, I served um, as a chairman of membership development, Delta 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 in my sorority. I've been a University 101 peer leader, a capstone scholar, member of Order of the Omega, and I've served on student government. Specifically, having the opportunity um, to be a member of the Legislative Action Network and the Secretary of Government Relations, where I currently serve and advocate for students on the federal, state, and local levels of government. I believe that the future is bright, I believe the future is collaborative and inclusive, and I believe that the future is Newton Porzio. Thank you, Nicholas. You can now proceed with your opening statement. And remember, you'll also have one minute to respond. Hey there. My name is uh, Nick Marzullo. I'm a finance, marketing, and a supply chain manager. And I'm not the uh, normal candidate. This is my first time trying to do anything with student government here at USC. But with that said, I am the president of two clubs here, Gamecocks for Positivity and uh, Future Finance Associates. Um, the reason why I'm running for president is the same reason why I started my club. I saw a great decline in mental health on campus, personally. I saw from, you know, just few, my friends, from people with uh, borderline about to kill themselves in front of me. So I'm here today to, you know, talk out about how I believe I can implement ways of my club into, you know, campus as a whole and just change the whole idea of what U of University of South Carolina is right now. And there definitely needs to be change, and I hope I can be the person there to help uh, put us where we need to be. Thank you, candidates. Now we'll proceed with some questions. I'll ask each of you these questions. Um, for the first one, we'll start with Garujal and move this way, and then Reedy, you'll start the next, and then Nick, you'll start the next. Does that make sense? Okay, perfect. So the first question is, in the past years, there's been a relatively small number of students vote for the executive positions. So as the student body president, how do you plan to represent the interests of all students on campus? And like I said, we'll start with you, Garujal. So to me, I think that one of the biggest issues on campus today is representation. And I think that it's very clear that students are not feeling like they're being represented and advocated for in the rooms in which they are not in. And so I think that for me, um, as somebody who is a first generation immigrant, but also a second generation Gamecock, that I view my life through a very unique lens. And um, I can see what it's like to feel underrepresented on our at our university, but I also understand what it's like to have a deep rooted love for our university. And so I look forward to collaborating with students and giving them the platform that they need and deserve to have to bring about the changes that they want to see. Thank you, Reedy. The same question to you. Okay. Oh, there it goes. Sorry. Um, yes. So I believe that the role of the student body president is to serve as a voice um, and an advocate for all students on this campus. And one of our specific platform points is the future is collaborative. Um, and so we have a plan to work with the office of the student or office of the president elect, um, who will be president elect Amaritas, um, to work with him and really bridge that gap between the student voice and the administration. Um, and we have ideas to do this, such as starting presidential office hours on Green Street and going to organization visits with him so that he is hearing the concerns of the students directly from the student um, mouth and the student voice because it's not appropriate, I, I believe, for one student to represent the entire campus. He needs to be hearing um, from all the students. And I believe that I would be able to combat this. I have served as, like I mentioned, the Secretary of Government Relations, where I was able to do advocacy work for the voice of all students on this campus at the federal, state, and local levels of government. And I would be able to do this on this platform as well. Thank you. Same question to you, Nicholas. Thank you so much. So I believe that there's a disconnect in between the actual student body and student government. Um, so one of the ways I plan on changing this is that's
Thank you. Is that microphone working all right? Okay, well, let's pass let's pass one together. And if you guys want to scoot together so it's easier to pass them. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're both going to the same. Okay. okay, great. So as you all have mentioned, we do have a new president elect who will be starting this summer. Um, so while I was reporting on that presidential search process, it was clear to me that students, faculty, and staff were unhappy with the election process and that students seem not to have much trust in the administration right now. So some of you have mentioned this a little bit, but please elaborate on how you plan to assist him in his transition and to build trust between students and the administration once again. We'll start with Reedy. Yes, as I just mentioned, um, our platform that the future is collaborative. I believe that it is the role of the student body president to serve as the voice of the students and to bridge that gap between student government in the administration, but also the student body and the administration that represents us. Um, and so, like I mentioned, starting office hours on Green Street, having the ability of um, the president elect and the student body president to go to organization visits, to get in front of people, to actually have real conversations with them. Um, and I believe that will help with this um, transition into the new presidency. Thank you, we'll go to Nick. Transition with, transition with the presidency works greatly with my, you know, idea of, you know, changing, recovering USC. Uh, so, you know, creating conversation with him and with the actual students is essential. So I hope to have him, you know, talk to me and be a part of my walk-ins where any student can come talk to them and voice their opinion. And uh, just collaboration with all different fields from organizations, service organizations. I want to Hopefully we can get everyone incorporated and do stuff together. That, that, that's my goal. Thank you, Garujal. Can you please repeat the question for me? Yes, definitely. So we were talking about the president-elect, and I was wondering how you plan to assist him in his transition and how you plan to build trust between the students and the university administration. So I see a clear disconnect between the student body and between their, both their student representatives and the university administration. And so one of the things that I believe could very clearly begin to bridge that gap and rebuild this trust is collaborating with President-elect Emeritus in finally getting a student vote on the Board of Trustees. We say this every single year, um, but I think that this year could be a period of growth and change. I think that due to the fact that President-elect Emeritus did have a student vote on his Board of Trustees at the University of Illinois, and um, in just listing the plethora of SEC institutions that also have a student vote on their Board of Trustees, um, for example, LSU, uh, Virginia Tech, the University of Kentucky, um, it's really indicative that a student, board, a student vote on the board is a positive thing. And I think that this would be, could it be a really, really clear way to ensure that students are feeling advocated for because they are they have representation in the room where the decisions are being made. Thank you candidates. So another thing that each of you mentioned was wanting to work on repealing the Heritage Act and wanting to rename some buildings on campus. This is also something students have asked us about on social media. However, this is not a new discussion and it has not yet been achieved. So what will you do differently to make a change? This time we'll start with Nick. What I'll do differently to make a change is Luckily, you know, I don't plan on getting into politics after this position at all. So I'm not afraid to, you know, really go at the, the people in the position who make these decisions. I'm not going to step down. I'm going to voice the opinion of the general student body and not, you know, let a future job affect from like how I will represent the student body. Thank you. We'll go to Garujo. So I think the problem um, that the university has run into um, in repealing the Heritage Act, and specifically student government has run into, is that we believe that we can do it on our own. And we try to push for this initiative on our own. Um, but the important thing to remember is that there are various student organizations, specifically like NAACP with their Aim to Rename movement, um, that are committed and have put in years and time and tears and sweat and love into repealing the Heritage Act to ensure that Every single student is feeling represented and safe on this campus. Um, I think that repealing the Heritage Act becomes a question of campus safety. And I think that every single student, as they walk through um, the horseshoe and into their classes, they should feel like this is somewhere where they're wanted and where they belong. And I think that, um, like we've mentioned in the past, new president-elect Amaritas, um, finally garnering a student vote on the Board of Trustees and just elevating our student initiatives and giving them the platform because there is strength in community and there's strength in numbers. Thank you. Go to Reedy. 
Yes, um, I absolutely believe in any and all efforts to rename the buildings on this campus. I don't believe that it's representative of who we are as a student body. But I feel the, the effects of the Heritage Act that are in our way. So what I would do differently is while I'm continuing to advocate for renaming of the buildings, I would look to the future and look ahead and see the tangible changes that we can make now. And that is dedicating the 2023 Campus Village to these individuals on the History Implementation Commission. That is creating statues on the Horseshoe and on Green Street. That's highlighting these individuals in a unique and different way while we are continuing to advocate on this movement and while we can't get anything done at this time, we're going to do tangible things and make tangible changes on this campus to highlight these individuals. Thank you, Garujo. 30 seconds to respond. Well, I agree that renaming Campus Village and creating different buildings and um, you know recognizing influential minority leaders at our university um, would be beneficial. It, doesn't solve the problem in any capacity of the word. Um, those buildings are still going to be named after Strom. They're still going to be named after Sims. And so while we may not have been as successful as we hoped, continuing to advocate for that and continuing to show the university and our administration that we will not back down, that we will fight up for what we believe in. That's and time. we You have 20 seconds to respond. I believe you are absolutely right in this. The advocacy work will never stop. Um, and like I mentioned, we will continue to advocate for it. I just hope that we can make tangible changes in the process of doing that as well. Thank you, candidates. I have one more question for all three of you before we go into some candidate-specific questions. So this is another thing that each of you have mentioned, and that's about trying to improve parking on campus. Again, this is something that um, users asked us through social media. And again, this is something that's not a new topic. And the university has already commented that pushing parking to the perimeter of campus is by design. Another thing to keep in mind is that it is very expensive if you're trying to create any new um, parking garages or lots. So I was wondering how you plan to feasibly improve parking on campus despite those obstacles that are in place. And we'll start with Grugel. So I think um, parking seems to be on every executive candidate's ticket, at least in the time that I've been at Carolina. And I think the problem is, like you stated, that creating new parking, creating new spaces for parking is far too expensive and it just is not feasible at this point. So what my administration would like to do would be to partner with local parking garages that are already in the city of Columbia, next to the Innovista building, next to Strom, next to Darla, all of those parking garages already exist. So if we can collaborate with the city of Columbia to ensure that students do have equitable access to those parking spots, that could be a great way to both to both increase and strengthen our relationship with the city while also advocating for student student needs and rights. Thank you. We'll go to Reedy. Yes. Um, like you said, parking is a huge issue on this campus. And um, that we can't change the infrastructure of Columbia. We can't change the way it's set up. But I think we should take a unique approach to the parking issue on campus. And I sat down and had a conversation with a representative from the Comet who said it was absolutely feasible to increase the shuttle routes um, on campus to surrounding apartment complexes that we have. This way, students aren't forced to buy a parking pass and spend almost $1,000 a year to struggle to find a parking place on campus where they're late to class, they're late to meetings. Um, and so I think that we take this unique approach and uh, continue our contract with the Comet to expand these shuttle routes so that students have another way to get to campus and they're not forced to, again to buy a parking pass. Thank you, Nick. Yes, yeah, so I agree with the shuttle idea, of course, that we definitely could increase, you know, just the distance, the locations, everything about sh shuttling. But uh, my, my idea mainly, though, is carpooling. To help incentivize carpooling, uh, one of the ideas is to create a discount rate if you co-pay with uh, a group of people. So the more people you pay with, uh, the cheaper the, the, the pass will be. Um, this will create the conversation of friends actually talking, asking what the schedule is of each other. And this will lead to less pain for new infrastructure, which we all know is probably takes up a great deal of our, actually what our tuition goes to. But um, so creating the conversation is what my goal is. Thank you. We're now going to shift into individual candidate questions. And we're going to be starting with Garujal. You said your experience would typically lend you to run for vice president. Why did you decide to run for president, and what specifically makes you qualified to be student body president? So like I mentioned previously, the past um, two years in, of my experience in student government has been in the vice president's office, both as a chief of staff and as a chief advisor. Um, 
And so I've seen very directly and clearly the disconnect between student government and the student body because the student body vice president does a majority of the engagement with the student body on a daily basis because that's where all of our programming comes through. So I've seen that program not being effective and I thought to myself that if our programming isn't effective, why? And it is because of that disconnect. There is a disconnect between the student body, their student representatives, and their um, university administration. And the job of the student body president is to advocate for that bridge of that gap and to advocate to rebuild that trust. And so that is why I chose my running mate, Faith Gravely, because she has so much experience in programming. She has such a great vision for our university and for our student body. And um, I just know that the positions that we are running for, we both have a, like a very advocate, or we have a great skill set for those things because That's of the time. fact. Thank you. Um, now, one platform point, point you specifically mentioned is wanting to integrate the university's websites to make it easier for students to navigate resources. The current student body president campaigned for a very similar idea. How do you plan to work with the university leadership to make your idea happen? So I think that the biggest thing that we have um, in terms of compiling those resources is that we're not necessarily trying to change each and every one of them at this point. We are trying to make them more accessible to students who may need them. Um, and because the resources that the university provides, like mental health resources, like access to STROM, like access to um, a physician if you need one, um, learning how to use your Carolina card correctly, all of those things are really, really important. Um, and so compiling them and making them accessible and more tangible so that students know where they need to go to be successful on this campus is our main goal. And I don't think that that would be um, as difficult as, as it may have been to sort of revamp all of those programs and then compile them. All right, thank you. We're going to shift over to Reedy. Now, Reedy, you mentioned that you're a fourth generation Gamecock. Your mother is on the University Board of Trustees and your father is in the House of Representatives. What do you say to students who are worried that your parents' positions of power will present a conflict of interest and skew how you represent the student body? Yes, thank you so much for this question. I really appreciate the opportunity to address this. Um, I have served as a student leader, and I think that my experience and my advocacy work here in student government speak more than my last name does. Um, a unique thing that my parents have taught me is how to be a public servant, how to listen to the needs of constituents and be able to relay those in hard conversations, and again, the power of negotiation to have those hard conversations, to be able to negotiate for the needs of the student body. Um, the role of the, the student body president as it currently sits is not a voting member on the board of trustees. It's just a voice, but I'm your voice. I'm the voice of every Gamecock in this room and on this campus. And so I don't view it as a conflict of interest. I don't view it as a negative thing. I actually view it as a positive thing. All right, thank you. Now you said you want to move advisors to a different model and use funding from the Student Success Center to do so. Can you explain what this will look like and how it will be possible to implement during your tenure? Yes, absolutely. Um, but just to clarify, it would not be funding from the Student Success Center. It would just be university funding. Um, and I have had a very poor academic advising experience. 17 minutes. That's all I've spent with my current academic advisor for six semesters of coursework. And that's completely unacceptable for any student to be worried about graduation rate, to be spending more money on having to stay longer because they are unable to get the courses that they need due to poor advising. The UAC model of advising would take our professors to the next level. It would educate them and give them the tools and the skill set that they need to help all of our students. It would ensure that every advisor employed on this campus is solely an advisor. They're not a professor that advises on the side part time. They're not an adjunct professor. They're solely an advisor and they're solely here to help the student body. All right, thank you. We're gonna shift over to Nick. Now, you don't have prior experience in student government, so how do you plan to navigate the transition to the top position and advocate for students while still learning the ropes? Well, adaptation has always been a key part of my success. Um, I'm a triple major, so I, you know, I love changing stuff up, and you know, I have a holistic general overview on almost any different subject or category, which I think fits well with being a leader and being a president. I can look at, you know, just everything overall and be the, the person to decide on what path is best. Um, and just, it, it, it's just, I, I've had uh, other positions, you know, of course, uh, I was president of two clubs and I'm still currently of, and I, I, I will use a lot of those same skills to transfer over. All right. 
Now, you began running with Lauren Young, who dropped out of the race. What does this mean to you, and how does this affect your campaign goals? Um, at first, of course, it was very discouraging. That's a big hit, and you know, you're know you definitely the underdog from there, and you have to really readjust your whole campaign. Everything that you've been building up, you have to rethink everything. And so I was on the line of um, dropping, but it, it ended up, I had a realization that the effects of mental health is everywhere. It's in front of us, it's behind the door, it's everywhere. And, and it, I would be selling myself short if I didn't create at least the voice here to you know, talk about change and how we can improve mental health here on campus. All right, thank you candidates. Those are all the questions that we had for you. Thank you. All right, then, so now the debate is over. Uh, the presidential candidates spoke, Garujo, Reedy, and Nick. We heard from them. We heard a lot about parking, about the Heritage Act, even a little bit about mental health mixed in there. So what are your takeaways from that set? No, I think it's very interesting, the whole idea about parking. You know, it's one of those things that I feel like has been around forever, you know. I think Garujo took a very interesting approach with working with current parking garages in and around Columbia itself. Absolutely. Um, and then we also, of course, talked about Reedy's connections with parents, both being inf influential in the Columbia and the USC area. I thought she handled that question well, and it was an opportunity for her to kind of speak to the students about why she'll still continue to be that voice for the students and not for her parents. Yes, I agree. She really did. She really took that moment to seize that connection and try to show, show her audience and the student body that there is a there is a disconnect between her and her parents. She's here to be her own voice and that she's a separate entity from her parents. Absolutely. So now, wrapping up, up our debate. We'll have a poll up on the SGTV News for Twitter momentarily so you can vote about who you think won the presidential debate as well as the vice presidential debate. Obviously, if you're going up for speaker, it would just go to Noah Glasgow, so we probably won't burden you with that. Um, reminder, SGTV will have coverage of the election results next Wednesday. We'll be covering the election all of next week, going from Tuesday and Wednesday. When voting is open, you can catch that. We'll probably likely be live on Instagram or Facebook with the results. Zane, why don't you tell us how we can get some reception about how the debate went tonight on that? Yeah, totally. If you feel like you want to throw some opinions, our DMs are open on Instagram and Twitter, and you can leave us a YouTube comment if you'd like. Absolutely. Daily Gamecock will also have a recap of tonight's debate, but that will do it for us right now. For SGTV News 4, I'm Will Groundsberg. And I'm Zane Heinlein. Thank you so much for joining us tonight.